Let's be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. I want to talk to you again today about how to get unstuck if you're stuck. I've been told that if you ever fall into quicksand, the last thing you want to do is struggle and try to swim yourself out of there because you just keep going deeper and deeper and worse in your stuck condition. In fact, you need to almost remain still and hopefully somebody comes along and throws out a branch to you and you hang on the branch or a rope and then they pull you out. Because if you struggle, you go deeper. I want to talk to you about a temptation to struggle when you're stuck and how that temptation to struggle, if you give into it, it's, it's going to take you deeper. It's going to make you worse. I want to talk to you about waiting on God. Now, I titled the message, I don't have time to wait on, wait on God. Uh, you may not have said that, but I know all of us have thought it. Especially when we're in a rush for God to do something. We want God to hurry up and get busy in this one area you've been talking to him about, this area that you've been praying about, and you're wondering, where in the world is God? Come on, God, it's time. And, and God says, I want you to wait a little bit because I'm doing some things ahead of you so you'll be ready when you get there. And I'm also doing some things in you right now so that when you get there, you'll be ready. But the word that comes loud and clearly in our direction is the word wait. And nobody wants to hear the word wait. I, I was in a hospital the, this past week with uh, some family members uh, in our church. And we were waiting on this surgery. That's the worst. You're just sitting there waiting and waiting and wondering what's happening and how's it all going to turn out, you know. But you're, there's nothing you can do other than just wait. Or I've told you about before, uh, I'm an overly protective dad and I've got two daughters. Now they're both grown and married. But let me tell you, when they were dating, mm, I would say there's always a curfew. And 30 minutes before that curfew, I was wondering why they weren't already back on that date. I just think, I'd be praying, God, what's going on? And, you know, it'd be 15 minutes beforehand. And they were, they were always, I think, always on time. But, I, but it was just one of those things where it, it, was, a, it was agony just to wait because I was overly protective and wanting them to be safe. And, oh, and, and Kristen, if you fast forward it now to now with phones, how many of you ever text anybody? How many of you, you text people? Well, maybe, have you texted somebody and you were waiting for the text in return? Well, maybe you can relate to this up here. Watch. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you can relate to that guy. It just seems like an eternity when you're waiting on that text and it never comes or it seems to come so late. I want to talk to you this morning about this gift that God gives us. It's called waiting. And it is a gift. I know it doesn't feel like it. It doesn't seem like it when you're having to do it. But it really is for our benefit. Now, there's this one passage of Scripture that I always go to whenever I'm thinking about what I need to do as I'm waiting for God, because I want to talk to you about how to be a, a active, not a passive waiter, but an active one. We're going to deal with that in a few moments. But I want you to see this verse, because it deals with the times when we for sure need to make sure we wait on God. Isaiah 40, verse 31. On the inside of your worship guide, there's a note sheet to follow along. It has the verse already up there on that, printed on that sheet for you. And it goes this way, Isaiah 40, verse 31. Yet those who wait for the Lord will, and then he's going to identify four things that God will do when you wait for him. These are God's way of identifying four different seasons in your life that you need to make sure that you give God a chance to do something in your life. And the way you do that is by waiting. So let's go back. Yet those who wait for the Lord 
will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. So there we have, we have four different promises from God. If you wait on the Lord, you will gain new strength. If you wait on the Lord, you'll mount up with wings like eagles. If you wait on the Lord, they will, you, you will run and not get tired. And if you wait on the Lord, you'll walk and not become weary. So what does that mean? What are we, well, we're going to go back to that in just a moment. But before we do, I want you to know that as I was studying this passage and I was researching the, the words, and I love this word waiting in the Old Testament, kaba. It's a word, it has a tremendous word picture involved here. It's God's way of saying, I'm at work in your life when you wait on me. And I work this way. You are like one strand. And he said, and God is like a hundred strands. And then your circumstances are other strands. He says, while you're waiting on God, he's weaving your strands in the midst of all his strands, sometimes in the strands of circumstances. He says, and what happens is that rope becomes very, very firm and unbreakable. And the longer you allow God to weave his strands in your life, you're going to find that you less likely be broken in a positive way. God says, I want you to be broken spiritually so that you can humbly approach me. But God says, but I'm doing something in your life to make you stronger. Whenever you wait on me, you're allowing me to weave a few more strands of me, my, my power in your life so that you can cope and deal with what you're facing right now. So I, I say that, that's the word picture behind waiting on God. It's God's way of saying, I want to strengthen you. When you wait on me, it's not like you're sitting back waiting for something to happen, but you're really, you're giving God permission to jump right into your life and do something that you could never do any other way that will prepare you for the doors that God is going to open for you tomorrow. Now, when do you need to wait on God? Let's go back to that passage one more time. It answers the question of those seasons that you face in your life, and, and I think you'll be able to identify with these seasons. Number one, when do I need to wait on God? When my tank is on empty. When my tank is on empty. You, you've been there before where you're exhausted. You've given everything you can possibly give of yourself. And you're just weary. You're tired. You're ready to chuck it all. You're ready to just give up. I'm tired of this. That's what I'm, when do you need to wait on God? At those moments of your life. Uh, listen, look at verse 31 again, Isaiah 40. Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. Why does he use the word new strength? Because all your old strength is gone. You're on empty. It's like you've been hiking in a desert and all that's there is sand. And it's, it's just dry and it's hot. And every step you take, you get thirstier and thirstier. And you just don't think you can handle it. You don't think you're going to be able to make it. It's just you're ready to just give up because all you can see is sand. God says when you get to the end of yourself, when you feel like there's nothing left in you to even give, he says, it's at that moment when you need to wait on me because I will give you new strength. I, for me personally, I, um, I, you know, I don't even notice that I'm, I'm thirsty most of the time until I take that first drink. I'll be outside doing something or uh, I'll be walking around or I'll be with my kids. It, was, it happened to me this past week on, on Saturday. Uh, a couple of my grandkids drove over here and they wanted to go to the beach. I said, can you just meet us there for a few minutes? And Sure. So I went to the beach and, and I just had a good time with them. And I was having, we were playing around and all that. And I left there about two hours later. Uh, I'm at home and I, you know, I think, oh, I'm a little thirsty, I think. And I grab that glass and I fill it up with water. I take one, one drink and next thing you know, flip, 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 flip. Because I'm dying and not even realizing that I'm on empty until I start filling up. That's kind of where he's describing. He's saying when you're at that point where you've come to realize that you're thirsty, then you need to wait on me. Because God is bringing you to that point of thirst so that you will thirst after him, not over after all these other distractions. Now, there's so much more uh, that I could say about this. Let me say one other thing, and that has to do with it, when we have a hurricane here. We had a hurricane threat this past fall. And, and everybody was a little nervous about this, and so there were people evacuating. And, and what was it that was said over and over and over again? Make sure you top up, top off your gas in your car just in case you may need the fuel to evacuate or whatever. Always cap it off. That's what God is saying here. When you get to that point where you realize that you're on empty, don't sit there and just wait for something miraculous to happen. You need to wait on God. Now, obviously, the question that just pops up when I say that is, what does that mean? How am I supposed to wait on God? What does that look like? I'm going to get there. That's on the other side of your note sheet there, okay? We're going to look at that in just a moment. But right now, I want you to see that when you are on empty, you are not alone. God knows that, and God has made provision. When you're on empty, he wants you to wait on him. Number two, 
When do you need to wait on God? When things don't make sense to me. Have you ever been there? Where you're trying to make sense out of what's happening to you? You can't understand why God would allow certain things to happen to your life. I mean, why is he doing this? Why is, why is he making me go through that season of life? Look at verse 31 again. Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. That's what we just looked at. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will mount up with wings like eagles. What's he talking about here? He's, he's talking about perspective. He says there are going to be those times when things don't make any sense because you can only see what's in front of you. You only feel the immediate pain that's, that's occurred to you. And you're wondering, I don't get this. I don't understand this. And all you can do is look up to God and say, what is going on here? I don't get this. And see, you're surrounded by things you don't understand. God is saying what needs to happen is you to be elevated above those circumstances so you can see a little bit more clearly what God's doing. It doesn't mean that God will stop the suffering where you are right now, but when you get a little above it and you begin to see what God is doing later and what he's been doing up to this time to prepare you for this, it makes a whole lot more sense. Usually this happens after the fact, though. After you've already been through it, when you get to the end and you look back and say, now I get it. I understand why God made me go through that particular path first because I couldn't have handled where I am right now unless he did that first. That's what, that's what God's saying here. When you're going through a time when you don't understand, you need to wait on God. Actively, you need to wait on God and ask him the question, God, would you help me to see the bigger picture here? Would you help me to understand? Now, you may not be ready to understand. I, 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 you know, it's, it's sort of like math. I mean, you may be really good at general math, but calculus, that's a whole other story. I learned that firsthand when I went from high school to college, and here I'm an engineering uh, major, and I have to take all this calculus, and I thought, I used to think math was fun until I looked at calculus. Well, that's kind of what we're talking about here. Some things that God would explain to me is all in calculus. I'm thinking, God, I don't get that. But then there will be other times when he'll explain to me in general math. Oh, I get that, God. And that's what he's saying right now, though. You need to wait on me. And I'll explain it what way you can understand it right now. But I may not give you the big picture yet because you're not able to do the calculus yet. So that's kind of number two, when things don't make sense to you. Uh, and, and by the way, that reminds me, uh, there's a guy named Maslow who, who said, if the only tool in your box is a hammer, you tend to see all your problems as nails. And, you know, some of your problems don't need a hammer beaten on them. You know, it could be that God's wanting to give you some sandpaper instead. Or it could be that God's giving you a chisel or a screwdriver or whatever. So, but, but as long as all you've got is the hammer, that's all you see. You interpret life around you as one with a hammer. I can beat that one down. I can beat this one down. And then you, you find that it makes it worse. And this is God's way of saying, you need to wait on me. Allow me to start equipping you with other tools. Wait on me. Then, number three. When do you need to wait on God? When you hit the wall. When you hit the wall, um, look at verse 31. Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles, give you perspective, and then here it comes. They will run and not get tired. This is a picture of a runner who hits the wall. Uh, my sons-in-laws and my son, they all love to run. I don't. Give me a basketball, give me a tennis racket, you know, give me a football, give me a baseball and a glove. I'll run all day long and doing stuff. But I don't want to waste my legs on just moving them, you know. You know, that, I mean, that's what runners do, you know. That's just not me. But all of them love it. And, you know, they're wearing their iPods, you know, their, their pods in their ears and all that stuff. I, I'm sure they're listening to my messages as they're traveling. <laughs> that's the only reason why I can justify, you know. But, but okay, I'm, but they're, you know, they're into running. And all of them have talked to me about the wall that they've hit. And the wall happens at different times and, and different times for them individually. I mean, it could be when they're trying to run a marathon, it hits them about you know, mile number 22. Uh, I could send, there are others, some of them said it hit them at mile nine. And my son has told me there have been times when it hit him really early and couldn't understand it, and then he was able to get through it. But you, most of the time when you hit the wall, it's your body doesn't respond to your brain anymore like it used to. I mean, normally you're just, you know, jogging around, you're know, running, but now when you hit the wall, it's, you're tired, you're, you can't make sense, of it, and you're a little cloudy in, your, in the way that you think about things. That's, that's the description here. He's saying when you're running, he says, when you wait on me, I'm going to make sure that when you run, you don't get tired in the fact that you hit the wall. I mean, this is, this is really important. God is wanting you to come to the end of yourself where you don't take pride in, in all the flesh 
God wants you to get to that point where you say, God, I can't do this anymore. God wants you to come to a place and say, I've hit the wall, and I've, I've done it what I thought was right all this time, but God, it's not working for me right now. I'm, I'm, I can't do anything right anymore. You've hit the wall. And God says, when you hit the wall like that, you're in the perfect spot, if you choose to wait on me, for me to bring about healing and restoration and encouragement there. He says, when you hit the wall, that is a time when you need to wait on God. Okay, so what does that look like? How do you wait on God at times like that? We're getting there. We'll get there in a moment, all right? There's one other season that he's describing here when you need to wait on God, and that is when you need a pep talk. When you need a pep talk, when you so need somebody just to get in your face and say, get over yourself. I mean, that's, that's kind of, that's what we're talking about here. Look at, look at verse 31. Those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not get tired. And they will walk and not become weary. They'll walk and not become weary. When it says they'll walk, it's, it's a description of the mundane. When, when you're walking, it's a description of all the tedious things that you have to do, whether you like it or not. It's just part of life. And God is saying, when you learn to wait on me, I'm going to give you what's necessary, the encouragement that you need to keep doing the things that you're called to do on a daily basis. It, it's, not, it's, it's something as simple as, let's say you, you are the parent of a brand new child. That little baby is now alive. When that baby messes its diaper, is he expected to change it? No, the parent is. And there are times, especially first-time parents, when they open up that diaper and take a whiff, and they're saying, oh, this is not my calling, it's mom. <laughs> you know? I mean, there, you, you have all these thoughts that go through your mind. These, but you're doing it for the benefit of the baby. I mean, it's not like when the baby comes home, you say, all right, now that you're here, you have responsibilities. We're expecting you to prepare meals for every Tuesday and Thursday for your mom and I. You don't do that, do you? Because the baby can't do that. Well, those are just responsibilities. There's all kinds of responsibilities that we have in life that you may or may not like. But you have to do them anyway. And the scripture's full of those. I mean, uh, the Bible even says if a man doesn't take care of his family, you know, he's worse than an infidel. Well, why does he say that? Because he wants us to take responsibility. There's so much in the scripture about this. But you need to understand, when you get to that point, it's not intended to, to be in your face and tear you down, but so much it to be truthful and say, this is what God is expecting of you when you're acting responsibly. God, God uh, there's that little baby. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, you know, God wants us to notice the little things. Too, too often we're in a rush, and we just want to keep going, 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 and you miss all the little things that God's put all around you to help you enjoy the moment. Don't, don't miss it. When you're tempted to just give it all up and say, I don't need this, well, then just know that God is saying, yes, you do. You just don't see how right now. Waiting on God needs to be your response when you're overwhelmed by the tedious, daily, boring routines of life. Rather than chunk it and get rid of it and say, I'm not going to do that anymore, you need to just say, I'm going to be faithful to the Lord with the things that he's given me. I'm going to be his faithful servant so that one day, and hopefully, he'll be able to pat us on the back and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. All right, now those are the seasons. Uh, there's more, but that, in that passage, he's saying make sure when you're faced with those four things, wait on God. Now, the question is, what does that look like? How do you wait on God? I mean, here's the picture. Waiting on God means you go and take a seat, twiddle your thumbs, and just wait until God does something. That is not waiting on God. Waiting on God is a very active verb here. And I, I want to give you a number of passages that I think will help you apply it. Number one, you wait on God by thinking about what God is like. You start here. Think about what God is like. It's not a, it's not a passive response. It's a very active. You, you're putting your, your mind in gear. Okay, what is God like? What do I know about God? Listen to this. Here's one of literally hundreds of passages that do nothing but just zero in on who God is. This is an example of what it, is, what it looks like when you wait on God. Isaiah 40, verse 28. Do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired? His understanding is inscrutable. 
He gives birth or gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Now, in those two verses, what we have are six character qualities of God. Six. Why are they all there? Because in the context of waiting, what you want to do is bring back to your recall all the things that you've, you've learned about God. You want to start with God. If you don't start with God, you start with yourself, and you begin to limit what God can actually do in your life simply because you've turned him into something that he's not. So you want to start with who God is. And in this particular case, it's just it's all about, okay, God is this way. But there are literally hundreds of characteristics of God throughout the Scripture there, I mean, we, when you think about who God is, what do you think about? He's a forgiving God. He's a grace, grace-giving God. He's a merciful God. He's an all-powerful God. He's an all-knowing God. He's, he, he's a healer. I mean, he, he, there's all kinds of things that you could say about God. But when you start with who God is and you think about who God is during your waiting moment, as you're waiting for God to do something, you just meditate on and you think about what God is like. That way, when he does work, you're more apt to spot it. But if you're just oblivious to it and you're sitting over here just tiddling, twiddling your thumbs, waiting for God to do something, he'll sneak in, he'll do what he does, and he'll sneak out and you'll never even know it. See, our, our, our dilemma is we want to sense it, we want to see it, we want to feel it, we want to taste it. And God says, oh, that's, that's all yours, but you've got to be zeroing in on who I am. The reason I've revealed myself the way I've revealed myself is so that you can know me. That's why the Apostle Paul, after he's, you know, he's lived a great life uh, as a Pharisee in, in, in the Jewish faith, and then he becomes a Christian. And he says, oh my goodness, I had everything as a Jew. And everybody looked up to me, and they knew that I was an up-and-coming key leader. And he says, but now, compared to knowing Jesus, that's all garbage. He says, man, this has just grabbed me. The, the ability to know God and know what he's like. He says, I love him. That's my desire. My passion is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. That's what he's talking about here. He starts now with God. And God says, you want to know what to do when you're waiting on me? Start with me. Start focusing in on who I am. Let, let me read one more verse to you that kind of pulls all this together. Psalm 52, verse 9. I will give you thanks forever because you have done it and I will wait on your name, for it is good in the presence of your godly ones. I will wait on your name. It's a decision by the psalmist here to wait. He says, I'm waiting in the context of who you are, your name. His name represents who he is. That's why whenever he does something in the Old Testament, he re reveals himself as a certain different name, that it, but it has everything to do with what he just did. So the, the psalmist here is simply saying, I'm going to wait on God by focusing and concentrating on who he is. Then I'll begin to get it. And that brings me to the second thing. If you're going to wait on God, you want to walk by faith. Not by sight. Not in the flesh. Walk by faith. Look at um, Lamentations 3, verse 25. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. To the person who seeks him. Now, the one thing I hope you get, you get glean from this verse is those words, who wait for him, who seek him. There's this desire to go after him. It, when you walk by faith, it's more than just knowing facts about God. It's more than just knowing verses by memory. To, to walk by faith means two things, and it's found in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Hebrews 11, 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For... And here it describes what faith is. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. If you're going to please God, you're gonna, you have to walk by faith. To walk in my faith means that you approach God believing that he is, that there is a God and there is a God at work and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So here, in this context here, walking by faith simply is your admitting that there is a God, I've seen him at work in my life, and I know that if I go after him, he will respond. That's what it means to walk by faith. Nothing more. It's not that you have to somehow earn a bunch of Christian points to cash in with God in the time when you need something from God. No, the Bible is very clear. God says just walk by faith. Don't trust your flesh. Your flesh will fool you. He says faith, and faith is simply you're looking to God and saying, God, I know you're there. I've trusted you, you've, you've re revealed yourself in many ways to me already, and I know because I'm coming after you and I'm asking you and I'm waiting on you that you will respond. That's, that's the second thing to do. The third thing, every, or spend time every day in God's word. 
Spend time every day in God's Word. Now, you're probably wondering, I, I, I use this point, I think, in every message I ever preach. Don't you agree? It's always about getting into the Word, read the Word, but that's because that's the only way we can know the truth. We can experience the truth in our life, but you're not sure it's true until God comes out and flat out defines it for us. So as you spend time daily in God's word, what God is saying is, here's what you need to look for. Here's what you can expect. Let me expose that which comes across as truth that it really is not. Let me show you what's, what is not true and how the truth exposes it, puts the light on it. That's every, we need to spend time every day. Why? Because God is so good. He is going to expose you to portions of his word that you need to hear today. You know, I, I challenged you a couple weeks ago that you read through the Bible in a year. And there's lots of different plans out there to, to do that. You could start in Genesis and go all the way through Revelation. Or you can do, there's a, there's a chronological Bible that will start you from a chronological approach. But, there's, but what's not, it's not so important that you go the chronological portal or Genesis to Revelation so much as it is that you're in the Word every day. And as you're in the Word every day, and if you're doing it like a chronological or, or Genesis to Revelation, what you're going to find is that God... It's so creative. He will use that passage, that Genesis 12, verse 15 passage that you saw, never saw before in your life to deal with what you're facing today. Especially if you take the time to think through it and say, God, why are you showing me this verse right now? Why are you telling me this story in the scripture right now? It's because God wants you to be prepared for what you're about to go through or prepare you for what he is bringing you through right now. It's so important that we, we spend time every day. But listen to this. Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. You can count on it. What you read in the scripture, you can just count on it. No matter what anybody else says, anybody, everybody else has their own opinions about it. You need to know this is what God says is true. Whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or not, it's still true. How about another one? Psalm 130, verse 5. I wait for the Lord. My soul does wait, and in his word do I hope. In his word, do I hope. There's one other verse I want you to see. Hebrews 4, verse 12. It says, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit. Man, that goes, that's pretty deep. Of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. When you read the scripture, God exposes the real you. Most of the problem that we have is with us. It's, it's how we think about things. It's how we respond to people or react to people. And God is all about us. And so he says, you get into my word, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to expose who you are. I'm going to divide up these things so you can see what part is of the flesh and what part of it's of the spirit. He says, this is God's way. It, it's, it's sort of the difference between the two Greek words in, in the Bible for, for word. you got logos which is the word, it's the word revealed, the word spelled out, it's the ink on the page, that's the logos, it's, it's the written word. But then you have this other Greek word, rhema. And rhema is, is a description of the, it's translated the word. It's, it's a word that you would use to describe you after you've let the logos have something to do with your heart. When God's word is freed up to actually affect you, then it's, it becomes the rhema of God has affected you. So that's what he's talking about here. He says, I want to do major surgery on you. And I'm going to go down there. And, and when you keep, you keep denying that you're not, you, you say, I, I'm always a forgiving kind of person. Or I'm a nice person. Or I'm always responsible. And I've obeyed you in every area, God. And God's going to say, well, let us go to the table now, the surgery table, and do a little work here. Expose your heart and your mind to the word. And watch what happens. God says, oh, you weren't nearly as compassionate as you thought you were. And you weren't nearly as obedient as you thought you were. That's what happens when you get into God's word. So you're allowing God to speak directly to your heart. That's what you do when you wait. You, wait, you expose your heart, your mind to God's word every day. Then, number four, get quiet and listen for his voice. Get quiet and listen for his voice. This is where we really miss it. Look at Psalm 62, verse 5. My soul, wait in silence for God only. For my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I shall not be shaken. My soul, wait in silence for God. What's that about? We live such hectic lives, such busy lives. We're moving from one thing to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing that we never take the time to listen to God. 
I mean, we even when we try to do spiritual things, we'll, we'll have a devotional time where we'll read the Bible on a daily basis. But you know what happens? You read the Bible just so you can check it off and say, I read the Bible today. But you didn't take the time to listen. You just did it where you just checked it off and said, I read the Bible. Yeah, but did you hear the voice of God? See, you want to read the scripture, but then you want to take it one next, to the next step. And you say, God, I see what you're saying here. How does this apply to my life? Help me to see what you're trying to expose here. You're listening to God. God is speaking. He's speaking so loudly and clearly you can't miss it unless you're not paying attention or unless you've chosen to listen to other voices first. And we're all in that category. And one time in our life, and we keep going back and forth, we're guilty of not listening to God. We'd rather listen to the voices of those who want us to not experience pain. We want to listen to those voices that say, it can be better over here. And God is not interested in making things better. He's interested in righteousness. He's interested in holiness. He's interested in doing things right. See, those are all part of that. So we, we just need to learn to get quiet and listen to God. It could be, a, and this is an exercise that I do, because um, I love, you know, when I'm driving, I wanna, I, I'm a hunter. I'm at point A, and I want to get to point B in the fastest amount of time possible, right? And so I get in the car, and I'm always evaluating. That car looks a little slower than the other one. I better get in that lane. I'm going to get over here. And then when I get just past him, if I, as soon as he gets far enough, I'm going to weave over there. I'm just going to get over there as fast as I can get there because that's just the way I am. I'm thinking from one thing to the next thing. And it dawned on me the other day as I was thinking about this very message and, and listening to God. I thought, you know, I'm driving by all these folks and, and asking the question inside, why were they so slow? You know, keeping me, why didn't I just kind of start praying for them? And I, and I noticed I started doing that and I, my heart rate started dropping a little bit, you know. I mean, uh, the pressure was dropping, you know, because all of a sudden I was more interested in the person than in getting to where I was going. And I think that's all part in learning to listen to God. It's, it's learning to insert that moment where you really do pay attention to God rather than just try to get another checklist, a Christian spiritual checklist checked off. All right, that brings me to number five. This is one you already knew, but you just didn't want stated. Expect God's timing to be different than yours. Expect God's timing to be different than yours. Uh, have you ever noticed how God is not the least bit interested in your timing? I mean, I, I'm very good about it. I give to God. I say, God, here's my calendar. I need you to do what you're doing between this and this on my calendar. And God in heaven laughs. <laughs> right, okay. No. His ways are higher than my ways. His ways are better than my ways. Yours too. And God is always interested in his ways because he knows his ways are always better for us. So when we're asking God and we're telling God that he has a deadline and he needs to take care of this by such and such a day, God's just shaking his head and saying, look, I need to give you the aerial view again to see that there's so much more going on than what you see right here. That's what he's talking about here. Expect his timing to be different. I love this passage, Psalm 130, verse 6. says, my soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning. Indeed, more than the watchman for the morning. What, what's he talking about here? He's talking about these, these soldiers that were assigned a watch. And they were there on the, on the fortress there and the walls there watching for any enemy attacks. At, 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 and they, you had full circle. You had somebody who'd be there maybe for six hours or 12 hours or for three hours. And there'd be a rotation. Then you'd have to have fresh people up there with fresh eyes looking for that so that they weren't taken by surprise. Well, here he's saying that those watchmen, they know what they're there for. They're there for a specific period of time, and they're going to watch it. But at the end of that specific time, they're going home. They're going to go home to eat. They're going to go home to, to talk to their, their families. They're going to go home to sleep. They're going to, they got other things they want to do. We do the same thing with our jobs. You know, we work X amount of time, and then the other time is our time to, to spend with our family or to do other things. And God says, listen, when it comes to time and me, God says, he says, I'm there 24-7, and you need to be watching for me 24-7. He says, there's not any time where you can just block it out and say, God, I'm going to do my own thing now. Because God says, I want you to wait on me. I, I want you to know that my timing is always perfect. And if you're not waiting on me, I'll open up the door and you'll never know it's open. I'll open up the window for you to crawl through at just the right time, but then the window will come back down. And if you're not there to go through the window because you weren't waiting on me, it was your loss. See, we, we can't treat God like he needs to rearrange his schedule to fit ours. We need to rearrange our schedule by waiting on God and saying, God, I'm going to do this in your timing, so I need your help. Help me to understand when you think this is best done. And don't be shocked when God says, right now. 
when we've been putting up excuses all the time, we didn't even realize it. He'll oftentimes do that. So expect God's timing to be different than yours. And then finally, number six, obey God in the areas he has already spoken. Obey God in those areas he has already spoken. I want you to hear what James says. You can't say it any better than this. James 4, verse 17. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. Let's say that again together. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. God knows. You can't hide it from him. He, he speaks to us and lets us know what, what he approves of and what he doesn't approve of. And he has his reasons. And they're always perfect. They're always holy. They're always good. We don't always see those reasons. But it's at times like this when we have to trust God. Oftentimes, you're waiting on God is simply because you refuse to obey him the last time you waited and he spoke. I mean, honestly, if we're going to wait on God and we're going to expect him to speak to us and he speaks to us and we refuse to do what he says, then what can you expect but just to be kind of in limbo? God's going to bring it up again. Don't you remember the last time you were waiting on me and I told you this? Well, yes, God, but surely you got something else now. No, no, I don't have anything else in mind until you deal with that. Now, what am I talking about? How about... Your salvation. You've, you hear me say, week after week after week, that you need Jesus. I need Jesus. We all do. That we're all born into this world separated from God because of our sin. That's our problem. And it's a huge problem. And God says, there's nothing you can do to fix the problem. You can't earn brownie points, spiritual brownie points with God, and say, now I'm doing better. Doesn't that count for anything? God will say, no. Because the wages of sin in a righteous setting is death. And God says, I can't compromise who I am. I'm a righteous God. So sin has to be dealt with by death. Well, we're a bunch of sinners. We, we've sinned against God. We're born that way. So, and the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, and then after that comes judgment. And what are we going to be judged about? Our sin. Well, God says over and over through his word, I don't want that to happen to you. But you can't change it, but I can, God says. So what does God do? God sends his son, Jesus, who's flesh and blood, but sinless, because he's God in the flesh. And he lives on this earth for 33 years, and he goes to the cross. He lets them crucify him. He's innocent, but he lets them crucify him because he's come to take your sin, my sin, on himself. So that when he literally dies, he is dying to pay the righteous judgment for our sin which is death. So Jesus hangs there and dies. And right before he takes his final breath, he says, it is paid in full. It is finished. And then he dies. That's Jesus. Three days later, he's raised from the dead. And he says, I died so you don't have to die. But you can still choose to die. What are you going to do? Well, you've heard that. What have you done? God's not going to Wear, bear, weigh you down by a lot of other things until you do business there because that's where everything begins that's where the change happens so I'm, let me ask you the question has there been a time in your life where you humbled yourself before God and said I'm one of those sinners you died for and I believe Jesus you died for me come into my life I accept the gift of forgiveness and life you offer me have you ever done that if you haven't now's the time to do it I can't do it for you nobody can but once you do it by faith, you're a different person. And then the rest of your life is a journey, a walking with God. Maybe that's what God said for you to do, but you put him off and said, I'll deal with that another time. You need to deal with it now. Otherwise, you're going to be frustrated and frustrated and frustrated over all the things that you've got to wait on God for. Because God's not wanting to get ahead of things. He wants to deal with the thing that really matters the most. And then for those of you who have received the gift, you, the Bible says that the very first step of obedience after you receive the gift from God is to go public with your decision to receive Christ, to, to let others know of your decision. And the Bible says the biblical way to do that is through baptism. That's why we baptize by immersion. People who get baptized by immersion, they go into the water. It's a picture of the death and, burial of re, uh, Beth, death and burial of Christ. And then they come out of the water and it's a picture of the resurrection. So when they're up there, they're preaching a message saying, I've given my life to the Jesus who died for me, was buried, and to the Jesus who rose again from the dead. 
That's, that's what you're doing. So have you obeyed him there? Uh, to, to expect God to, to fill you in on more details of your life before we obey him in the areas we've already been spoken to is presumption. God says, I want you to do what I say. So if you need to be baptized, then, then you need to set it up. We baptize just about every service, and we baptize at the beach twice a year, any of those. But you, and we do it publicly because this is your time to go public with your relationship. It's not a secret thing. It's a very public thing. So if you've never done that, make a decision to do so. The water can be heated, by the way. I, you know, the fact is, I, you know, Easter's almost here. Easter will be here in about six weeks, and it looks like we'll be in the new building by then. And when we do, wouldn't you like to be baptized there on Easter Sunday, if that's you? What a, what a testimony that would be to all the people that will come on Easter. Those people are serious about Christ. Wouldn't you like to do that? Maybe you're, you've not been baptized yet. That, I would encourage you to do that then. Please. There are seasons in your life that you have to wait on God. It's always inconvenient. It's always painful. You don't want to do it because you can always think of other things you'd rather do than wait on God. But God says, you've got to learn to wait on me. Because when you wait on me, you're allowing me to weave my strands of strength and wisdom and holiness around your strands. You left to yourself are easily broken. But if I weave you into my life, you're going to find that life in me is worth it. It's what I intended from the beginning. Please don't put that off. Let's stand together quietly as I lead us in prayer.